should I give you like like the real answer of how I came to write this book or should I give you like the the book pitch answer? Give us the real answer. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I'm a writer. I've been writing a lot of stuff. An agent reached out to me and he's like, hey, Matt, you know, I'd be interested in representing you and, you know, talking about some, some book ideas and stuff. And I said, oh, I don't know. Um, but we went to get some breakfast tacos and, and talk about stuff. And he was like, well, what are you interested in? And I gave him like five, six, seven different things that I'm interested in. And it kept being like, oh, but I don't really know if that's a book. Uh, I don't really know if that's a book. And I agreed with him, frankly, this, you know, but so I'm really interested in housing. I'm interested in immigration policy. I'm interested in transportation. Um, I dabble a little bit in kind of how should we frame things in politics and trying to get progressive people to be more patriotic? Um, I see one of you up here has got an American flag in your background and, and I love it. Um, you know, but these were all kind of mm, topics. It wasn't really a thing. <laughs> and so, you know, we had a nice time, but we didn't really come up with an idea. And Uh, sorry, I, I was out with, with with a friend of mine a little bit later, and you know we were having some beers and getting pretty pretty thick into it. And you know I was like, "How about this for a title? What if I had a book and it was called One Billion Americans?" And he was like, "I don't know." And he's like, "What's that book about?" I was like, "It's about how there should be one billion Americans." Um, and I, what I liked about the idea was that it ties together a lot of different things that I am interested in. So if you read the book, you know, one chapter is really about, um, welfare state design and the case for investing more money and supporting uh, families and children and also a theory of how we should design programs that do that. There's a chapter that's about housing. There's a chapter that's about regional development policy. Um, as you guys know, in, in Chicago, um, Chicago is a really big city. It's doing well. It has some problems, but it's there. Uh, but a lot of other Midwestern cities, you know, are in really deep, trouble. I mean, Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, um, the smaller ones, you know, Milwaukee, Akron have just seen their populations crater. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in, in those problems of, of those places. I'm interested in urban transportation issues. You know, how can you make buses run better? Um, how come Chicago, why, the L has much lower operating costs than the subways in New York or Los Angeles, San Francisco, DC. Um, and I think a lot of people don't know that, don't know what, what's good about that. Uh, but our construction costs everywhere in the United States are, are sky high. Um, so a billion Americans is a thesis that poses a lot of really obvious questions, like where are these people going to go? How will we get around? What will we do? And so I was able to pull in tons of stuff that I was writing about, that I was covered, that I'm kind of fascinated by, um, and sort of use answering the billion Americans question as like an excuse to delve into all these topics. Uh, but there is also a thesis that I believe in and that I stand behind. Um, and so, you know, the, the pitch version is, uh, well, you know, Donald Trump was president and a lot of us, we were very concerned with, you know, how that happened and how it went and the theme of American greatness. And I saw that, you know, to truly be great, we have to embrace our destiny in the world. And, you know, I have a whole official argument that I suppose I can give you. Wonderful. Why don't you tell us that a little bit in the book, you, the premise is to just uh, is really that you know the vehicle to get to one billion Americans would be yeah. through immigration, would be through potentially pronatalist policies. Tell us a little bit about how you know the U.S. might embark on tripling its population. Sure. Um, so there's two real ways that a country can increase its population. Uh, one is to import more people from abroad. The other is to grow our own here at home. Uh, I think that we should do both of those. Uh, some people fall in for a kind of either or framing. Um, you know, I think there's compelling arguments for each. Uh, one important one that I think a lot of people don't realize is simply that um, in surveys, people have fewer children than they say they would ideally like to have. And we've been falling kind of further and further behind people's stated goals. And it's not because, you know, people, um, 
the economics of having kids have gotten worse. Uh, when you ask people, why don't you have more kids than, than you do? Uh, the number one reason they give is the cost of childcare. Uh, the number two reason is, well, I didn't have enough financial stability. Uh, the number three reason is about trouble finding the right partner, but then four and five are other things related to cost. And so sometimes people will say, oh, you know, we shouldn't do all this pronatalist stuff. It's just, you know, people don't want to have children. And there's a like a level on which that's true. But then the question is like, why don't they want to have children, right? Like, I don't want um, certain things because I can't afford afford them. But if I could afford them, you know, I, I would want them. It's, it's stuff that, that I would want. And so, you know, why has having children become less affordable? One reason is that um, relative prices change over time. Um, so you can do these charts where you show, you know, furniture has gotten much cheaper over the past 40, 50 years, but healthcare has gotten more expensive. Uh, college has gotten more expensive. Childcare has gotten more expensive. Basically, things have gotten more expensive that involve human beings, like in person interacting with each other. And taking care of kids is really, really high up that list. The other thing that's happened is that the returns to education have grown. Uh, more people go to college, more people go to graduate school. That's good, um, but it's sort of more economically necessary to achieve financial stability to do those things. And even for people who aren't on a college path, um, to get a good job without a bachelor's degree requires a certain amount of training and apprenticeship and things like that. So, so it's equivalent. It's harder to establish yourself financially when you're young, and it's a particularly hard to do that if you're taking into account the costs of taking care of kids. The problem is that we are still limited uh, by some of the aspects of human biology. Um, you know, I am older than my dad was, um, you know, but when I was his, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and he in turn was older than his dad was, right? So we've been starting families at later and later ages for good reason, but our ability to, you know, keep, keep having kids and to keep taking care of kids, like I'm 40, like my knees hurt, you know, and that's, that's life. Um, but it's, but it's kind of caught up with us. Um, so there's a lot more that we could be doing to support people in family formation, both in terms of marriage penalties in the welfare state, but also provision of things like preschool, child allowance, child care, uh, health, you know, you name it. There's a, there's a whole kind of long trajectory there. Um, and then there's ways you could design the welfare state so that it is pro-family and, and supportive of those things. Um, then you have immigration. Uh, we have a lot of immigration to the United States. We have a lot of controversies about about immigration. And we tend to be stuck on a couple of hotly debated partisan disputes in terms of what to do with the large existing undocumented population. And then should visas go in a family unification paradigm or should they go in a skills-based paradigm? Um, but if you kind of open your hearts uh, to the possibility of simply uh, more people, then you don't need to have this zero-sum competition between, you know, the visa programs that help people from Africa and the visa programs that get computer programmers from India. Uh, right now, you have a lot of constituency groups sort of fight against each other for this fixed pool of visas. Uh, but immigrants are actually really good. They drive a lot of economic benefits. Um, we would have more cities in a state of population shrinkage if we didn't have immigration. And we should try to design policies, um, you know, that address the concerns that people have about immigration, rather than saying, okay, I'm worried about X, so let's not let anyone come here. Let's say, okay, you're worried about X, so let's, let's address X, you know, let's, um, let's try to take care of X and do what we can to kind of um, help you out. So one of the positions of the book is you know, not only would there be benefit to the US, you know, domestically, if we significantly increase the population, but that it would put us at a more competitive advantage globally. Um, and so around these parts, we like to talk about global matters. Uh, so I want to just have you expound on that a little bit, just the idea that there, obviously, we know there are many um, nations across the world, some of them democratic, some of them not, with significantly larger populations than the US. What do you think 
our sort of um, competitive edge is right now in relation to let's say a China or India and growing, how would growing the population substantially really put us at an increased leverage spot or um, how would that impact our position in standing globally? Yeah, I mean, you know, so there's this crisis sort of unfolding right now uh, around Ukraine. And I don't I don't even want to give an opinion about what we should do about that. But just the observation that everyone in the world is really interested in what does the United States of America plan to do about this? Um, They're also pretty interested in what does Germany plan to do? And they're a little interested in like France and the UK. They're not that interested in Denmark's stance on this issue or Portugal's uh, or New Zealand. And that's not because Denmark and New Zealand aren't great countries with high standards of living, but they're, they're little countries, right? What New Zealand thinks about global issues is not important. What the United States thinks about global issues is very important. But these are two countries that in some ways, like our values are similar. We speak the same language. We're both very prosperous. Uh, we both really like uh, dairy products, you know, um, big exporters of dairy products, the US and New Zealand. But the difference is there's 330 million Americans and there's like four people in New Zealand. So everything America does inherently matters in the world. And historically, you know, you go back to pre-World War I, or you go back to the interwar period, times when the United States was pretty withdrawn from global affairs. We didn't have a large military establishment uh, in 1914 or in 1938. But even without a large and powerful military, other people around the world knew that the United States was important because we were so big, because we clearly could build a very large military establishment if we wanted to. And when we decided we wanted to, uh, we pulled it off. And you see this, you know, around the world, right? People are very interested in what does the People's Republic of China think about things? What are they gonna do? How are they gonna put Joe Biden to the test? And when you look at, you know, China's level of prosperity, they've done a lot of impressive things over the past 30 years or so, Uh, but they're about on a par with Bulgaria in terms of you know wealth per person, and nobody is really worried about you know well what's Bulgaria going to do you know what's what's happening in Bulgaria, and it's because Bulgaria is a small country, China is a giant country, so that you know at half of America's per person wealth, they can be a much larger economic block than we can. Um, India is quite a bit poorer than China, uh, but still matters a lot on the world stage because it's so super gigantic. Um, So throughout the 20th century, the United States was the biggest rich country and the richest big country. And being in that intersection of big and rich made us incredibly important. Um, Today, some of the other big countries, and particularly China, have gotten richer. And it's putting American sort of primacy into question in a way that I think has some troubling implications for the future of the world, but also even for the relationship with China. It's making the US-China relationship hostile because both people on both sides of that table are aware that American primacy could kind of wane away. And growth, population growth, is why America became a great power in the world in the past. And I think that it is a traditional strategy of national greatness and national development that we ought to re-embrace. So you mentioned the sort of um, military aspect and I see people are butting in with questions in the chat, which is awesome. Please flood the chat with your questions. Um, After we talk in small groups, we'll have um, Q and A with Matt. Um, And I just, I'm interested in, you talked about the military aspect. You talked to, the framing of this is very much in a traditional state making and power making paradigm. But I'm wondering what does, shifts in technology, especially as it relates to the military, how does that impact the need for, you know, a a billion bodies on the ground to really display and show military might or population might? Um, How have advancements in technology, um, have they undercut the need for this? Is there there a a little bit uh, overplay on the traditional power and state-making aspect of the theory here? 
you know, we're a little bit past the time when I think, you know, you need like a huge army of grunts uh, to go to go do things in the world. At the same time, there's a very close relationship between population size and the ability to lead in technological developments that, you know, the size, I mean, there's just a, a kind of brute force aspect, right? The more it's much more likely that the great innovations of the future will happen in the United States than in Ireland, because there's so many more potential innovators here. If we grow the population, if we are welcoming to the world, we sort of can further lead in technology. Um, but we are also um, not just in that brute force sense, but as a relatively big place, we are a place where people want to bring products to market. Right, the United States is in a position to shape the future of everything from electric vehicles to nuclear power uh, to artificial intelligence because we carry so much weight in the world economically. We are, um, I have a friend who refers to the United States and the EU as um, regulatory superpowers, right? Because you need access to that market. Um, you know, you go to the Bahamas, right? And the stuff that's for sale there is just the stuff that complies with American regulations, because nobody is going to custom design a new kind of dishwasher just for the Bahamian market. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the Bahamas. It's great. Great people there. Great culture. Great society. But it's small. Right. Whereas America can say, well, we want you to do it this way. And companies are like, oh, yeah, like we'd, we'd better do it that way. Now they can complain. Right. They'll hire lobbyists. They'll go to Congress. They'll whine. But at the end of the day, if we say you need to do this to get access to the American market, if we say these are the rules of the road, people will comply with that. Um, so developments that happen here have more significance than they would in a smaller country. And um, uh, the future, I think it continues to be the case that the aggregate size of marketplaces is very significant. So there's a theory among some that, you know, authoritarian leaders across the world are making the bet that democracy just can't work. And that's really the main issue that countries like mm. the US are facing. And so taking that theory um, with a pinch of salt, just a pinch, I'm wondering what would adding tripling the population, uh, would that change that dynamic? And, and further, would you not be able to argue that increasing um, the population of the US significantly could lead to even greater polarization domestically and producing a more problematic and muddled democracy? You know, I don't think so. I mean, I think that for one thing, you know, the problems with democracy are overrated. Um, you know, this year for the first time in a while is actually the first year that American GDP has grown faster than Chinese GDP. I think that, you know, five to 10 years ago, I think a lot of people were very impressed with the idea that in the PRC, you know, they could take decisive action and they didn't have to deal with all the messiness of democracy. I think more recently we've seen the, tr the traditional critique of authoritarianism that, you know, you have this closed system, you have a political leader who's not accountable, you don't have scrutiny of what's going on, and it leads to poor decision making. And, you know, I think that she has been looking more and more erratic to a lot of people, they don't really understand what's happening, uh, entrepreneurs don't have secure property rights, um, and it's really called into question what the next generation of Chinese companies is going to be, their COVID policies, which initially seem like they were working really well. They now seem uh, stuck in this kind of COVID zero course they can't get off of. So I think there's a, a robustness to democracy and to the mess of it all. Um, it has, uh, democratic politics has more self-correcting and self-equilibriating properties. I do think that in terms of polarization, that a downside to the unipolar era in world politics was that it got Americans to spend a lot of time fighting with each other, right? So that, you know, the people, like I, I drive a Prius, um, but my father-in-law, he drives a pickup truck. 
And those kind of differences between like, I'm here in Logan Circle with my Prius, he's there in rural Texas with his truck. This like loomed really large, right? And we had like the people who were wearing the funny red hats. And then we had the people who were wearing the pink knit hats. And we were, you know, we're really gonna go at it with each other. And something that is uh, constructive, about thinking about China, thinking about Russia, thinking about these, these foreign countries is we actually have a lot in common as Americans across that kind of you know MAGA resistance divide. Um, and there are things that we can do together as a country while we disagree, but also have some uh, common goals. Um, so it's been interesting to me to see that bipartisanship has broken out um, in, in the US Senate around what they call the US Innovation and Competition Act, which has really rolled together a bunch of ideas about like science funding and possibly they're gonna put immigration provisions in. Um, some weird, some stuff that's like actually anti-Chinese, uh, but some stuff that's like, well, they're gonna ban the sale of shark fins in the United States, which is really just like an animal cruelty cause, but it's associated with China being bad. So they, they toss that that in there. Um, we're going to increase um, domestic semiconductor construction possibilities, uh, which is a good thing, but also kind of has this China angle. So I don't want to say that like ginning up anti-Chinese fervor is good, but thinking about competition on the global scale has, I think, helped bring people together. It's brought, you know, Tom Cotton and Ron Wyden to think about um, well, what do we want to do for American semiconductor policy? Instead of just thinking about how to fight with each other, it's like, how, how do we work together? What can we agree on? How can we have a disagreement that's within reasonable boundaries? And, and a lot of what I try to do in the book is, you know, I put forward ideas that I mostly learned about from the progressive uh, policy community in DC, but it's mostly wrapped in kind of conservative-ish concepts about values and national interest and, and things like that. Uh, because I think, you know, I think like smart progressive policy wonks have a lot to say, uh, but I also think that conservative people um, have a lot uh, they have a lot to say too, you know, and there's a lot to some of the, the values driven uh, Trump stuff almost. And that, you know, if we, if we think about a big national project, we cannot eliminate partisanship or something like that. People disagree, but we can turn down the temperature on some of the culture war aspect of contemporary politics and focus more on specific questions and interests. Yeah, I, I will say you find um, in, in journalism and also on Twitter, which is certainly not journalism, um, that conservatives talk a lot about population growth and population decline in the U.S. So I, 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 I do agree with that. I'm wondering, though, um, we're two years into off of a pandemic. We've got about 70 percent of the population vaccinated, and it was has been a slog to get there. Um, there's been writings about not enough masks, not enough tests. So I just wonder with experts having predicted this pandemic and um, for decades predicting that pandemics could become more frequent, uh, how does tripling the population put us um, in a position to handle this again, were it to come up? How, how does the US handle um, increasing crises related to health and climate? Uh, with a much larger population. What does that look like for you? Well, you know, so I, I pitched this book, I don't know when, 2019, something like that. This wasn't on the radar. You know, it was working, working, working. And as we got to the part of the book publishing process where I'm turning drafts in uh, to the publishing house, this was spring 2020, you know, and we were in, in pretty, you know, hard lockdown. And I got all this feedback, you know, people were saying, oh, well, you know, doesn't the pandemic prove that, you know, dense cities uh, like are terrible and, and very unhealthy. And that's something a lot of people were saying in April of 2020. Uh, but then we've seen over the past 18 months that, you know, that was really a myth um, that, you know, dense cities probably tend to 
get pandemics first uh, because they have a lot of air travel and they kind of filter out more slowly into rural areas and, and small towns. But, you know, what really sort of influences the spread of disease is crowding, not population density per se. People everywhere you go spend most of their time like indoors. I, I mentioned my, my father-in-law before, and he's a, he's an actual outdoorsman. He, you know, runs a cattle ranch, things like that. But like most people in rural Texas, even they'll like affect this cowboy sensibility and they wear boots and like weird hats, but you know, they're just like in stores and restaurants and like they're inside, like everybody else um, driving around their cars. So, you know, I don't think that growth is necessarily a huge deal one way or the other in terms uh, of vaccination. You know, in terms of some of the other themes of the book, right, um, one of the primary inventors of mRNA as a concept was a Hungarian immigrant to the United States. Uh, one of the primary developers of the actual Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was the children of Turkish immigrants to Germany, right? And it, it goes to show that, you know, sometimes people will do these event studies where they're like, oh, well, how are wages influenced by the arrival of some immigrants? Um, and those usually come out more optimistic than some people would think. But they miss like the big picture, right? Like what if, those inventors, parents had not moved from Turkey to Germany, and therefore their kids hadn't been able to get the kind of high class technical education that's available in Germany. Like how much lower would wages be everywhere if we still didn't have that stuff, uh, if we didn't have mRNA, right? So bringing people, bringing smart, talented, hardworking people to what is really the greatest country on earth just has these incredible benefits for the world. And you can see that in hard technology. You can see it in, you know, I, I was thinking about um, the late uh, Sidney Poitier recently, you know, he, he passed away. There was a lot of coverage of that. I looked up some of his old movies on, on streaming video. They're fantastic. I, I noticed that like his accent was a little odd and I, I didn't quite know why. And I looked it up and it's, well, you know, he grew up in the Bahamas. Um, so that's a perfectly good reason. Uh, but, you know, when somebody like that, when somebody with supreme talents comes to a country that is full of opportunity, they are able to do incredible things at vast scale and like make everybody much, much, much better off. And that's what the American story, I think, is really about. And ultimately, it's like it's how we beat the virus. It's how we tackle big problems.